Are you looking for a way to teach your kids how to be smart with money? Greenlight is a debit card for kids that parents manage with a handy app. With Greenlight, you can set parental controls to decide the exact stores where your kids can shop, receive real-time alerts, automate allowances, and more. The app even teaches kids lessons in trade-off decisions and money management skills. Join Greenlight today at greenlightcard.com slash garage. That's greenlightcard.com slash garage. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is the music man, the host, and taco connoisseur. He is the captain. It is Taco Tuesday, bitches. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week we are drinking Anheuser-Busch's Budweiser, an American lager and an American classic. This may seem like an odd pick, but hear me out. We've been discussing the disappearance of Brandon Swanson, and Brandon loved the Minnesota Twins and was known to always be wearing a Twins hat. Anyone that has been to a Twins baseball game knows you can grab a beer at the Budweiser roof deck located in the left field corner of the ballpark. It's the ultimate Minnesota Twins outdoor experience it's the king of beers that's right so to all the listeners tuning in from the great state of minnesota we say this buds for you garage grade three big bottle caps and we would also like to thank and send a big cheers to jill in columbus ohio and a big shout out to denez in forney texas next up we have a shout to michelle in san juan capistrano california and a big shout out to Tiffany in Buford, Georgia. And next, a big long distance cheers and big thank you to Tim from Seattle. And last but certainly not least, we have Stevie in Bay City, Michigan. Everybody we just mentioned went to truecrimegarage.com and donated to this week's beer fund. And for that, we give you a big thanks. Yeah, make sure after you donate to be calm and be patient because we're going to get to you. It might take a little time, but when you hear your cool name. Cool yourself. Chill yourself. Chill yourself out. It's going to take a little bit of time, but once you hear your name, you're going to get excited. So excited that you wee in your pants. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. We covered the details and some of the speculation regarding the night and early morning hours of 19-year-old Brandon Swanson's last known whereabouts last week. Now, we need to cover the search that ensued for Brandon after the discovery of his abandoned green Chevy Lumina, which was found hung up in a ditch on the side of a gravel road. And reminder, this was approximately 20 miles from where Brandon thought he was. The searches have been exhaustive, thorough, and in my humble garage opinion, highly professional. Investigators brought in search dogs, which started at the vehicle. The dogs led investigators up and down some country roads and then to a woods by the banks of the Yellow Medicine River. The descriptions of this river are really all over the shop here, Captain. While the depths of the river range from anywhere from just knee deep up to 15 feet in certain areas, this particular area, meaning parts of the Yellow Medicine River within walking distance of where Brandon's vehicle was found, several people have stated that this part of the river is much more like a creek-sized waterway. But we should also keep in mind that like with most waterways, the Yellow Medicine River's depth can vary greatly depending on the time of year. At the time Brandon disappeared, it's reported that the river was flowing high and fast, 
with spring runoff still impacting the flow. So by most reports, we are talking about a very strong current at the time. According to Sheriff Vizeki, quote, there are two miles of the river in that area, and it took six hours for deputies to walk it. He said he personally walked the river every day for 30 days. Quote, at the time, the dogs indicated and it was believed that he must have fallen in the river in that area, end quote. The sheriff then added, so we searched that area on the premise that he had been washed downstream, but the dogs didn't just track Brandon's scent to the river's edge. According to Brandon's mother, Annette Swanson, one bloodhound followed a scent from the stranded car down a gravel road to a farm. She said this was a long trail. It was about three miles. This long trail is what led to the Yellow Medicine River. Annette says when the dog walked them up to the river's edge, the dog jumped in the river but then jumped back out. After jumping out of the water, the dog continued to walk, following a trail up to another gravel road. This was a road that separates Lyon and Lincoln counties. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, the dog loses the scent, she says. Now, because the dog actively jumped into and then back out of the river and then continued along a scent path that ended into nothingness, investigators are not convinced that Brandon drowned in the river. Sheriff Fazeki pointed out that had Brandon fallen into the river, he should have been found in the river or downstream somewhere. No trace of Brandon has been found anywhere. But if he was washed away in the Yellow Medicine River, you'd think that something like a, you know, a shoe, his jacket, anything would have been found. As the river dried up later in the season, this exposed more of the land along its banks. More searches were done during this time, but still, again, nothing turned up. The area of the river that is in question that was searched, it was searched over 50 times all with no results, absolutely no evidence other than the dog leading them to the river that Brandon, you know, that he was ever even in the river, that he drowned in the river or remains in the river to this day. Were there multiple dogs? Because sometimes they'll have multiple dogs and sometimes they have one dog and they do multiple tests with that one dog. So throughout the years, what gets a little difficult in this case when we're reporting on it there have been so many searches and I'm certain that throughout the years, there's probably been a search or two that only contained one dog, but a lot of the stuff that I was reviewing, they're referring to dogs, plural. So I believe that we're talking about multiple dogs. Now I don't know that using the searchers words and the sheriff's words, It's a little conflicting because at times they say the dog led us to the river's edge. And then other times they say the dogs led investigators to the river. So I don't know if in this exact point, if it was just one dog or multiple dogs. The other thing we need to keep in mind too is sometimes we're dealing with different kind of tracking dogs, dogs that are trained to look for different things. Right. You know, sometimes when you're looking for search and rescue, you're, you're tracing a scent. And other times they're, they've actually brought in cadaver dogs, dogs that are looking for human remains. Right. The problem here is again, captain, the, the yellow medicine river, I think could hold some secrets, but the problem with that is other than the dog or the dogs leading the investigators to the river, there's never been any other evidence that Brandon went into the river or drowned or, you know, and remains in the river to this day. (laughs) Right. But the the problem is we have, we have no evidence of, we have no evidence of a lot of things. So I, I do want to go to a comment that I saw by his mother, Annette Swanson. And this seems to be backed up or at least a shared feeling by other family members. They don't seem to be 100% convinced that Brandon drowned that night. And then I think you have to go back to this because if in fact, if you believe the search dogs accuracy, Brandon entered and then exited the river. Yeah. So 
look, I want to try a little exercise, if you will, Captain. This, but hold on a second. Go ahead. It's it's difficult because we don't know how the dog tracked. Let's say the dog jumped into the river, jumped out of the river, and then walked the the river's edge for you know a quarter mile or whatever, and then veered off into this other path. That would make me believe more likely that he went into the river and went down the river for a time period enough for the dog to follow the scent. The problem with some of these reports is that we don't have this great detailed report or we don't have video footage of what actually happened. So to speculate too much either way, you might as well pull out your crystal ball and and make a guess because you don't know. Well, of course, nobody knows. And that's why this is a an interesting case, and that's why it's still talked about so much to this day. But, okay, so you say detailed description, detailed report. I, I want to try a little exercise here, okay? And this will be quite helpful, I believe, especially to those who are either familiar with the area or for those who did look up a map of this area like we mentioned last week. I want to go through a detailed description of the part of this search. Okay. There's a lot of searches throughout the years, but I want to go through this one in, in very good detail here, because again, I believe with, with the dog information, the dog tracking information, if we believe the accuracy of the dogs, this is really one of very few pieces of possible evidence that we have to go on. Right. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Here's what we do know. Dogs tracked Brandon from his abandoned car. Remember, his car was found in Lyon Lincoln County Road, one and a half miles north of Route 68. So on the map, if you're looking at it, go north of Route 68 and continue north past 390th Street. On my map, I placed a pin on Lyon Lincoln Road at the halfway mark, but right between 390th Street and 160th Avenue. So we know from the conversation he had with his folks, Brandon thinks he is near Lind, and he eventually comes up with the idea to meet them in Lind via him walking there. He says he sees the town of Lind or the Lind town lights from his car. Right. And he's going to walk towards the light. So there are two things we can deduce from his statements here. One, Brandon is basically heading in a northwest walking direction. So he believes he is southeast of Lind. Well, northwest of Brandon's car is the town of Porter. So he is very likely seeing the lights coming from the town of Porter. So, number two, he thinks he is southeast of Lind. Mm -hmm. So, again, if the dogs are right, from his car, Brandon walked half a mile south on Lyon Lincoln Road and then turned right onto 390th Street. He walked on 390th westbound for about a mile. Then he makes another right onto County Road 16, walking northbound. He walks for about a half a mile, and then he decides to go off of the road and make a left, now walking westbound on a private driveway of what has been described by at least three sources that I could find. This is a driveway belonging to a, an abandoned farm. Right. He continues westbound for approximately a quarter of a mile and then veers off the driveway and continues on roughly following the course of the Yellow Medicine River traveling northwest. Well, again, we also have to be clear about these driveways because a lot of these back roads are rough, right? They're not, not every single one is paved nicely. A lot of them are gravel roads, yes. So you have to, uh, you, you can't um, assume at this point that, that he knows if he's going on a road or a driveway. Right. Would that be safe to say? Right. And and again, he may not even care as long as right. he believes that he's right. making his way in that direction that he wants to go. So now he's 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 kind of very roughly following the course of the Yellow Medicine River, traveling northwest. But but how how much is the distance between the car and and the river? Like 
if you had to guess? Well, it's difficult because there it's very different between where the you know how the crow flies to the route that he is taking because he's taking a very roundabout way of getting there. He's he's going we see him going south and then he's going west and then he's going north and then he's going northwest. Right. So he's traveled a few miles once you add this all up. But again, he's he's not taking a direct cut right to where we have him now. Oh, well, and I think this is important be, because we do have a little bit of a time gap um from when his when his father decides to take his mom home to come back out and we have a time gap and then they're back on the phone and and do and I know that time gap is kind of blurry but I, I think the key thing here is what I'm what I want to point out to everybody if they are following along on the map you can you can really see where about he would be based off of the information of the dogs and it's once he starts doing this this route that that roughly follows the yellow medicine river there traveling northwest this is approximately where the bloodhound jumped into the river and then jumped back out. Now, the the handler, as we said, interpreted this behavior as possibly indicating that Brandon might have fallen into the river at that point, but then Brandon traveled onward, walking, heading north toward a gravel road. It is here that the trail ends. The dog or dogs lose the scent. Really, any number of things could have happened here to, to make this trail end. The, the scent vanishes. He starts off in a very roundabout way of walking northwest with the idea that he is walking into town. This, obviously, regardless of what town it may actually be or what town he thinks he's walking into. I want to point out some things here, too, that are kind of working against Brandon, if that is his exact movements. Remember, we talked about... This is a route, you know, Route 68 would be a route that he would have taken from school to his house. I think rather than assuming that he knows the area well, I would debate that quite heavily. I question that that off of anything off of Route 68, he may not know at all. You know, he may just take the simplest way to and from school into his house day after day after day and never veering off of that route 68, which he is clearly off of at this point. Right. And anybody that knows these country roads or, or not, not exactly these country roads, but country roads in general, you might be able to go, well, I, I go down this main path and then I head down one country road and that gets me to another town. Mm -hmm. Right. And then that's your path. But once you jump onto these, you know, other country roads that you're not familiar with, they could, take you anywhere you want to know right you know what i mean so and again so i think there's also evidence that backs up that he doesn't know the this area so well because we have evidence that he's not where he thinks he is 100 we right. we know he's not where he thinks he is and and what i think's working against him here in this situation alcohol no i think that there are things there are indicators that to to tell him that he is where he thinks he is. Meaning if I, if I'm looking around and I go, Oh, Northwest of me, there's the lights coming from should the be town. Lind, right. Should be Lind. Oh, but it's not Lind. It's Porter, but and, it's something. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an indicator to him that he's, he's right, even right. though he's clearly wrong. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, the direction he's taking from his vehicle to walk into town, traveling Northwest, let's pretend he does know the area very well. This would work against him even more because to walk into Porter, he would need to cross a major road and there's a river that runs into Porter. Okay. Right. That's the red wood. I'm sorry. The, the North branch of the yellow medicine river runs into Porter. Now, if he were to walk Northwest into Lind again, he would have to cross a major road. 23 instead of 68 mm -hmm. there's another river that runs that direction into the town of lind that's the red wood river right that's if he knew the area so well yeah if he knows this area right. really well he's going well he's still going to be confused he's going yeah. shit i'm right 
Mm. There's the town of Lind. I know it because here's the river backing my feelings up, and here's the road that I have to cross backing my feelings up as well. I still think he's impaired. He could be. He could be. And I, and I think we can we can debate that here in a little bit, but I, I want to go through some I'll of the search. I'll debate it now. I want to go through some of the search efforts here, Captain, but to, to go right. through all of them would be ridiculous. If you want to to dive into that even further, that stuff is available online. And specifically, I want to point out um, some of the sources for our research here. We have Footprints at the River's Edge, blogspot.com. Mm -hmm. That site has been raising awareness for specifically for missing young adult males since 2002. And then there's a really interesting thing regarding this case. We have Jeff Hassey, who has really been the one that's led these, these uh, searches. And there is a website, the search for brandon.blogspot.com. This website. But who's this guy? He He's in charge. We'll get into him in a minute. But okay. uh, one thing I want to point out while I'm telling people, if you want to look into it yourself, Check out that the search for brandon.blogspot.com. That is basically a website that reads like individual journal entries for each search that took place. And they have journal entries listed for searches that were conducted over a three year time period. Right. So very detailed information there. The areas around Brandon's car where his car was found, they were searched using ground searchers, ATVs, horses, and helicopters. Yeah. A company that we've talked about many, many times, Texas EquiSearch, did come in to help bringing in underwater sonar devices, a remote-controlled plane, and other high-tech equipment to help the search efforts. And still, nothing was found. Before, you'd have to raise a bunch of money to get somebody to go up in a helicopter. Now, with technology, we can use these these drones to cover so much area and detail. Right. And then by July of the year that he went missing, the Lincoln County Sheriff acknowledged that he personally believed that Brandon Swanson was likely deceased by this time. And they're still searching at this. And this is where we have the, if you review the, the sheriff's statements throughout the years, I think he's just really kind of perplexed by this whole situation because you will see statements where they say he can't be in the river. We've searched it so many times, but then here in July of the year that we went, he went missing. We have the sheriff saying, we believe he's deceased and, and he likely fell into the river. Yeah. Now within a few months after the quote unquote official search for Brandon stopped, which was actually about 10 days after he went missing, a new private search company took over the search for Brandon this was, and this is going to answer your question, this was Search, Rescue, and Recovery Resources of Minnesota, which was headed up by a man named Jeff Hassey. Mm -hmm. Hassey is not your amateur civilian search organizer. He uses scientific methods and mathematical calculations such as theoretical maximum distance traveled equations, probability studies, and statistics to come up with the search areas and likely scenarios. Besides his work for the SRRRMN, <laughs> that's, that's a handful there. That's what we should call the show. Yeah. Hassey is the founder of Midwest Technical Rescue Training Associates, a nonprofit organization that teaches technical rescue skills to public safety providers. Well, they're going to do some kind of scientific and mathematic equations as far as, you know, the average human can walk a mile in, in, in 15 minutes, things like that, mm -hmm. uh, to kind of narrow down the search a little more. Thank you, Captain. And, and I, I want to talk about this because we talk so much about criminal profiling on this show. Well, when you think about it, Jeff and his team are using similar techniques to try and find and rescue or return lost persons, basically taking whatever evidence they have. Here we got the car, the scent trail, the phone call with dad saying, oh shit, and then the car call drops. They're going to take that information and layering, layering that with information and statistics collected from previous search efforts. 
you throw that algebra equation into a blender and boom, now you have prioritized search areas. You have a game plan. One of these statistics is quite interesting. Hassey says, and, and this was to the independent where he said this, he says, quote, retrospective studies based on the international search and rescue incident database found that in these circumstances involving abandoned vehicles, the subjects were found within 5.6 miles from the last known position. This is 95% of the time. This yielding a total search area of 98.5 square miles. The median distance is 1.3 miles, so 5.3 square miles search area. There's one statistic used to help prioritize the search areas. And also, you might use this equation as well. The average person, as you pointed out, and this is what they're going to use in Brandon's situation, walks one to three miles per hour, yielding a one to three mile search ring, or 3.1 to 28.3 square miles. This is based off of he's in the car, he's walking for 47 minutes while talking on the phone to his father, right. and then he says, oh shit, and the call drops. You would use this information in regards to what you know by the information provided by Brandon's mother and father. What time he started walking from where he left his car and ending with the old shit moment. That's the indicator for his disappearance or demise, if that's the thinking. Now, I think that that's some fascinating stuff, and we will get back into that in a bit when, when we get to the theories and our thoughts. But that's what they're kind of working with here. Look, he points out 98 point, what did we say, six square miles? So roughly 100 square miles. That's a huge area to try to search. And anybody that knows this area, we're dealing with farmland. That's difficult, especially when you, we're talking about when the, the crops are high. Yeah, very much so. And then also, like you said, there's multiple water sources. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you have to use this information to profile where you think he may be to prioritize your search areas and your search efforts. With HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit, you'll get easy, seasonal recipes, and pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your door. All you have to do is cook and enjoy. HelloFresh makes cooking delicious meals at home a reality regardless of your comfort in the kitchen. From step-by-step -step recipes to pre-measured ingredients, HelloFresh gives you everything you need to get that wow-worthy dinner on the table in just 30 minutes. So let's say goodbye to endless grocery store trips and to takeout food. HelloFresh offers something for everyone, from family recipes to calorie smart and vegetarian, and fun menu series like Hall of Fame and Kraft Burgers. And it's so flexible. Easily change your delivery days, food preferences, and skip a week whenever you need. Or add extra meals to your weekly order as well as yummy add-ons like garlic bread and cookie dough. I love HelloFresh. It makes me a ninja in the kitchen, and most importantly, it makes my week totally awesome. I love when it's a HelloFresh week. Last week, all right, I was making chicken, cheddar, fajitas with bell pepper and pickled jalapenos. This week, making figgy, balsamic pork with roasted green beans and rosemary potatoes. I love HelloFresh because they've made cooking easy. They've made it better much, much better. And I'm getting to cook new things. I'm trying new recipes every week. For $80 off your first month of HelloFresh, go to HelloFresh.com slash garage 80 and enter promo code garage 80. That's like receiving eight meals for free when you go to HelloFresh.com slash garage 80 and enter promo code garage 80. Support for today's show comes from third love. With more than 70 sizes, including their signature half cup sizes, Third Love designs bras with breast size and shape in mind for a perfect fit and a premium feel. Everybody we've talked to loves Third Love. I even know several people that say that is now the only place that they shop. It's because you're going to get 
the most comfortable bra that you can buy anywhere. This is hands down the most comfortable bra that you will own with straps that won't slip and tagless labels. Not to mention lightweight, super thin memory foam cups that mold to your shape and are proprietary to third love. Best of all, every customer has 60 days to wear it, wash it, and put it to the test. And if you don't love it, you can return it, and Third Love will wash it and donate it to a woman in need. Yeah, so many listeners of ours shop at Third Love. Family members, sisters, mothers, aunts, they all love Third Love. Third Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone. So right now, they are offering our listeners 15% off your first order. Go to thirdlove.com slash garage now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 15% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash garage for 15% off today. No one really has the time to go to the post office. You're busy. That's why you need stamps.com. Stamps.com is a must for any small business owner. Stamps.com brings all the amazing services of the U.S. post office right to your computer. Whether you're a small office sending invoices, an online seller shipping out products, or even a warehouse sending thousands of packages a day, Stamps.com can handle it all with ease. Simply use your computer to print official U.S. postage 24-7 for any letter, any package, any class of mail, anywhere you want to send. Then once your mail is ready, just hand it off to your mail carrier or drop it in a mailbox. With Stamps.com, you get $0.05 off every first-class stamp and up to 40% off priority mail. Not to mention, it's a fraction of the cost of those expensive postage meters. Right now, our listeners get a very special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale without any long-term commitment. We love Stamps.com. We use Stamps.com. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in Garage. That's Stamps.com and enter promo code Garage. That's Stamps.com, enter promo code Garage. All right, we're back. Cheers, me mateys. Cheers to you, Captain. Oh, I want to give a, another cheers here. I got mm-hmm. a fantastic message from a very longtime friend of the show. Remember Gina, private investigator down in Texas who helped us out with the dark past episodes? Yeah. Uh, Gina, Gina, badass. Yeah. Uh, regarding serial killer Felix Vale. So she had some kind of thing to go to at one of her children's uh, schools or one of their classes, she wore the ban the van t-shirt to oh, yeah. the school. She said that the teachers loved it and the kids were very confused. <laughs> <laughs> She's hoping it's a life lesson for, for, I guess that class. Well, we're going to start, uh, sponsoring police, um, uh, police departments to go into the schools, just like the dare program. We're starting the ban the van program, ban the van program. Yeah. So regarding the searches, Captain, there there were multiple searches, as we said, over a number of years. Parts of the river were even drained. Now, on the five-year anniversary of Brandon's disappearance, TwinCities.com discussed the scale of the search for Brandon, saying more than 500 volunteers, including 34 dog handlers from nine different states, spent more than 120 days searching for Brandon and covered part of 120 square miles. We have Jeff Hassey, who says it's by far the biggest search that he has ever been involved in, in terms of length of time, number of missions, and number of searchers involved. Remember, he's the search manager. A search in October of 2013 focused on the Mud Creek area. This is a few miles northwest of the town of Porter. The cadaver dogs consistently hit on the creek, leading searchers to believe that the waters from wherever Brandon's body is located somewhere in the watershed were possibly washing into this creek, and that's why the dogs are hitting on this area. Again in 2015, Searchers searched farm fields northwest of Porter, where the dogs were hitting on a scent. 
This included an area that they had not been able to search for several years, and this is because of harvest schedules and bad weather. Ken Anderson, president of Emergency Support Services in Minneapolis, who partnered with Jeff Hasse, said searchers concentrated on the area northwest of Porter because search dogs were, quote, still getting the scent that says there are remains of a human in this area, end quote. So we're, again, we're assuming those are cadaver dogs and not scent dogs that they used before. Correct. Yes, this is according to cadaver dogs. They are hitting on areas northwest of the town of Porter. So it may be likely that Brandon's remains are somewhere in that area. Again, this is a large area. Right. And it's my understanding that these dogs, when they hit on this scent because of winds and such, they can be hitting on this even for miles away. Mm -hmm. Now, another search was conducted just last year in May of 2018, and this was um, just another search where they really they found nothing. Now, I do want to point out here, too, something that I think is important to this case, is that back in March of 2010, the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, the BCA, they became the lead investigating agency on this case. The BCA has said that the case remains open and leads continue to trickle in. In fact, last year in 2018, Derek Woodford, BCA special agent, said, quote, the case is open and just last week I got another lead or two. Sometimes you need a break in the case. All it takes sometimes is one thing. So we're not giving up, end quote. And we talked about this a little bit on Off the Record uh, recently, where if, if, if you are working a case and the trail has gone cold for you, you may trade it off to another investigator. You may hand it off to somebody else. Put some new eyes on this thing to see if I missed anything. And we also see situations with these cases where they will hand it over to a whole nother agency completely. And that's what happened here in 2010, March of 2010. Let's start to get into some of the theories here, Captain. Uh -huh. There's a lot of them, right? Because Brandon's disappearance is, it's very frustrating and it's mysterious. He was on the phone with his dad and then he wasn't. And now no trace of him has ever been found. Well, not just that. I mean, he says, oh shit. And then the phone gets disconnected. Right. Right, and, and so the internet is just rife with rumors and theories about what could have happened to Brandon. Right. Uh, I think we... It's a big topic on Reddit. Yeah, and, and there's so many, so much so out there that we can't list all of them, mm -hmm. uh, but we're going to try to go through some of them. Yeah, you could read stuff about, you know, possible um, abducted by aliens. Um, that was first on my list. Alien or some other strange abduction Sasquatch. or disappearance. Mm. possible Which, sasquatch right i think i think if that were to be the case it would be better recognized on some other show right mm -hmm. yeah um unless you feel different no i don't think there's any evidence of that i'm uh, not saying i'd rule down as out as a possibility on a case if if there was like some sightings that night Oh well, we we had three hundred sightings of a UFO, and then this kid went missing. Right? I, maybe I'd have a little more weight to it, but I think sometimes in these missing person cases, they go, "He was probably walking down the road, and and Bigfoot got him, you know, or the aliens took him, or um, the Mothman, <laughs> or he he went into a time portal, uh, you know, just have some kind of you, evidence of this." I, you know what? I thought there were a ton of theories out there i think you just added two more to to the possible theories but there's no evidence of those so they're not well and you know what it, i one sad thing well i mean this this whole case is tragic and sad but when i was doing research for brandon's case our old friends thinking sideways covered the case oh yeah and it brought a tear to my eye devon I listened to the thinking sideways and, and basically what they said in Brandon's case regarding alien abduction, that it, this was kind of 
funny. Uh, they were saying Devin, Joe, and Steve. There was no crop circles. If if he were abducted by aliens, there would have been crop circles. And I obviously I don't know that to be true, but I found <laughs> yeah. I found that to be funny on their show, and right, I miss right. their show, and I miss those the the those guys. Yeah. So let's get into some of the much more likely theories. Here's mm-hmm. one that 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 is constantly in this case. Mm-hmm. It says Brandon tried, and and some of this is ripped straight off of the internet. Brandon tried some bad meth that night and had a bad reaction to drugs and or alcohol that he have he consumed, and he got so disoriented, enough so that he got totally lost. Mm-hmm. Well, we know he was lost. We have evidence of that. So this well, theory, no, I, this they they mean isn't. lost for good. Right. So phone gets disconnected. He says, oh, shit, maybe the oh, shit isn't that big of a deal. He keeps walking. He goes further. gets even more lost. That's a possibility. Mm -hmm. I think the difficult thing here is I I don't think he'd be so impaired or so unhealthy that by the time, um, and yes, this is a rural area. But by the time that the the sun would come up, up, I would think that Brandon would get to a road and at least see somebody um, pass him by, and possibly could get help. Mm-hmm. So that's the only reason. Mm-hmm. That's the only problem I have with this theory. You know, and this theory in itself almost seems cut and pasted from Brandon Lawson's case, right? Brandon, same first name, tried some bad meth that night. Mm-hmm. that's that's a theory in both of those cases and what i want to just like scream from from the top of the mountain is this shouldn't be any news flash for anybody it's all bad meth yeah <laughs> there, there is there no, is no good, good meth. meth all right just don't it, do meth that's what we should call our band good meth well here, um, here's all right ban the van campaign mm-hmm. was uh was this year maybe good next meth. year's campaign is don't do meth bad math right so again this is ripped straight off of the internet um it, it's total speculation but here's some things here it, it's been thrown out there that brandon maybe tried drugs that night possibly meth mm-hmm. and then behaved just as brandon lawson did disoriented and confused possibly even seeing things right. now we referenced a pipe that was found in brandon swanson's car the pipe found in his car is of unknown origin. These are the words of Sheriff Dahl. That I hope I'm saying that right. It's D-A-H-L. Mm-hmm. He said that it is not known whether the pipe even belonged to Brandon. Police, in my opinion, must not have given it much weight because they have publicly stated that they do not believe that Brandon was impaired that night. The problem here, though, right. meth is a real possibility. Apparently, this area of Minnesota is so, it, it's no stranger to meth troubles. In fact, the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension website contains two options for public access. One, search public criminal history. The other one is search methamphetamine offender registry. It's There's so much of it that they have to give a whole yeah. category to it on its website. So well, clearly there, yeah. there is a problem in that area. Well, it's 2019. There's a problem in this whole country. So, correct. So yeah, we don't have to worry about that. That's, that's a possibility. Uh, and again, you could have done something, um, at one of these parties cause we assume that he went to two different parties. So there's two different accounts of possibly where he was at and is in, you know, and his partiness of a, his his level of partiness that mm-hmm. that that night, but we have a situation where he's a little lost. He's a little confused. Tries to call some of his friends. They don't answer. I think if he is on something, he wasn't so messed up that he wasn't afraid to call his parents. Right. And right. I, or I, so I, messed up that that there's no there's nobody inside. There's nobody involved in this case that is saying we believe he was so messed up that that's what led to his demise. Yeah. And think about the brand. Everybody on the outside is going, well, he probably just did some meth and, and ended up <laughs> hallucinating, but we have the father, yeah. we have the mother, we have the sheriff, we have friends. Right. None of, none of them are going, yeah, he was so effed up that, 
that he ended up God knows where. And we can get into that right now because, like I said, we have these two accounts of these parties. Yes, maybe the first 60 days or so, or or maybe even less than that. But what was he drinking? Not really for sure. Uh, I don't think he was drinking too much. Maybe he didn't want to get him in trouble. Maybe he smoked some weed. Maybe they did some more than that. I think if they would have done more than that, as time uh, would have went on, I think his friends would have came out and said, you know what, uh, we didn't want to get him in trouble at first, but it's important for us to let you know that he he, he smoked meth that night, right? Right. Uh, that has not happened. Uh, and then I think the other thing that has not happened is with the Brandon Lawson case, for example, we have a 911 call that makes zero sense. Right. And that and we have a um we have a situation here with Brandon Swanson where he's talking not only to his father but also to his mother mm-hmm. and both of them are saying that he sounded fine. Right. Now he now that could be he sounded fine for um it being that late at night and being a little confused on where he was at. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't think there's really any any indication that he was on some psychotic. Um, well, that he's hallucinating and he's right, totally right, right. off his rocker here. Right. He, it's not like he's. Because he talked to his father for 47 minutes. That's after other phone calls with his mom and dad. Right. 47 minutes. That's a tough time to try to play the sober game. Right. And look, I think you and I could agree that he's probably somewhat impaired. I mean, it's late at night. We know he's had a couple of drinks, but. It, right. The, the, the thing I want to really point out here. I, I would say, and I'm just going to put this out there, I would say he's as impaired from the alcohol as he is from uh, just being tired. And well, and he, here's one thing that I want to, I want to really go into and maybe not stay on it too long. But one thing that I really looked at when looking at this case was, okay, I go into a lot of these with with the idea that there may be foul play. So let's at least look at that angle. Okay, if there was foul play, who had the means and the opportunity to be involved in that foul play? Well, in this situation, we have mom and dad who are saying they spoke to this boy, their their boy, shortly before he vanished forever. So one thing I did, and I, I apologize to the family, but when I went into this case looking into it, I wanted to know as much as I could find out about mom and dad and their search efforts and what took place the night that he went missing and, right. and since then regarding mom and dad. Yeah, I mean, but Be- that that's what you have to do. Right. And what I can tell you from, from what I've spent two weeks on looking at mom and dad, I can tell you they only have one agenda in this entire huge story. And that is to find their son. They have at no point. I don't, I've never got the feeling at any point that these are parents that are going, well, yeah, he was really messed up, but we don't want the memory of Brandon to be that we want the memory of him to be good and wholesome. No, 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 no. I'm telling you his parents, the vibe I get captain is that if whatever would help them find their son, they will say it, they will do it. Right. They don't care about public opinion. These people have spent years. They've spent time. They've spent money, lots of money. Some of these searches were volunteers and a lot of this stuff, they, they spent their own hard earned money trying to find their son. And and, and we all know somebody that has struggled with uh, addiction of some level and you know, their parents. And most of the time, those parents do not shy away from their kids problems. Mm-hmm. So I don't think it's like you said, you're going to have these overly concerned parents on trying to find their kid, but they're not willing to tell the truth. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. Right. And the other thing too, which is, you know, people compare this case to Brandon Lawson, but they also, the, the meth believers or the people that state that he did some bad drugs on this night, they often point to the case of Michael Wamsley and Janelle Hornickel. This yeah. was th- this was a very famous case in Nebraska. The two were very high on meth. Again, all meth is bad meth. They suffered delusions, and they were calling nine one one multiple times 
reporting that their truck was stuck in some snow. They ended up freezing to death just within two miles of their truck. Again, though, this kind of points back to me that mom and dad don't think he's messed up. The sheriff doesn't think that he's messed up. The friends don't think that Brandon's messed up. And what happened in this other case that everybody keeps pointing to? They found the bodies. They don't find Brandon. We don't know where Brandon Swanson is. I have an issue, though, with with the whole car thing. And again, I don't know the road that well. And so getting to the point where your car is stuck, that, that concerns me. And again, I think that leads to being impaired somewhat with um, just tiredness and then also being somewhat impaired by the, the alcohol. Um, maybe enough to just go, I, I don't, I can't get out of this mess right now. So I gotta, I gotta start walking, take off on foot. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, I don't know the road that well, so it could be just, you know, happenstance where here's this kid that went to turn around or went to do something with his car. And it just so happened to be the wrong place to do that at. And that yes. even, even if you're sober, you're going to get hung up on it. Yes, I I would think so. And looking at pictures that I found of the site and of the area, that's what it looks like to me. That okay, so these are these are long country roads where there's not much turnoff. You know, there's not like a spot where you're like, oh, I'll just pull in here and back out and turn around. Right. This is the, and especially not a lot, not a lot of houses on these on these roads. And especially think of think of yourselves out there, right? Okay. We've all been in a situation where Man, I'm handsome, where we're frustrated, where we might be in a hurry or we're lost or turned around or whatever. And we're frustrated and, and we do something out of haste that in the end we realized was just a dumb, stupid move. Right. And the thing that I think here is looking at these pictures, it appears to me there's not any turnoffs and he's like, you know what? I got to turn around. I think he just made a bad turn. I think, I think there's ditches on both sides of this road. And, and, it's, and it's maybe a, nar- a little it's pissed a, off. It's and a, so he, he yeah. was a little too aggressive. Yeah. It's a, na- a narrow road. And I think he thought he could make the turn, but he didn't. And also if your drive is taking you a little bit longer or th- th- it's such a frustrating thing to, to be going, am I going the right way? What the hell's going on? And like you said, that, that maybe just a little too aggressive. And, and that stops you from um, being able to drive your car. We rolling. Another theory, Captain, is that Brandon could have been hit by a car. Mm-hmm. Now, many people like this theory and believe that possibly the oh shit that he uttered was in response to an approaching vehicle. For this to be the case, obviously, whoever hit Brandon had to take his body and the body was taken away to hide after this accidental death. Okay, so the the reason why I like this is that we have evidence that the dog goes to the river, gets gets out of the river, goes down another path, kind of in um, ends its search or ends the scent, kind of in the road. Mm-hmm. So that would make you lead. You know, that's evidence to show that this theory makes some sense. Correct. I you know I've heard this. I found this to be quite strange. Some of the searchers were saying, you know, the, the dogs can only follow the scent for so long. Yeah, I believe that. I believe that too, but I don't fully comprehend it. And, and what I'm getting at is, so, so what they're pointing out is that at this spot on the road where the dog lose the scent or the dogs lose the scent right. is because they've been following it for so long that they, they point out that that doesn't actually mean that the scent went away or right, right. that they that branded that something happened to Brandon in that spot. The problem with with look, there are several holes in this theory. I like this theory too mm-hmm. at first, but when I really started thinking about it, I I I I distanced myself from this theory because because of the holes. One, if something happened to Brandon at that spot, it's not like they can't find that spot. They were led to that spot by the dogs. There should be some you would think there would be some indication that something happened there, possibly blood or, or anything else. Right. And, and we know like, let's just, we can assume that these people search and go, okay, well, here's roughly 
where the scent stops. We're going to look, you know, before that and after that. Again, we have no blood evidence. We have no, we also have no evidence of him telling his father, oh, there's this car coming up on me. There's none of that. There's no, that's the, where that's the, where the theory falls apart. Okay, he's saying to his father just before he says, "Oh shit!" He's describing that he's walking along a fence line, that he's off of the road, he's going through a field, and that he can hear water. So this doesn't sound like an area that you're going that that a car would be driving through. Right. The car would be on the road if this was was an accident. This car is not driving in the middle of the field. This between car fences. is driving on top of a fence. Right. So, so th- if if that in fact is true, then that part that makes the theory impossible. Now, let's mm-hmm. pretend. Go back to what you were saying. Let's pretend that Brandon was walking on the road. Right. Uh, if here's the problem with that, his father is driving around looking for him. There is no way in hell that Brandon does not say to his father, oh, I see you. You just turned. I'm right up here. Do you see me? I see your headlights. He would, if he saw a car, he would very likely assume it to be his father first. Or even if he didn't assume it to be his father, he would say, wait, there's somebody coming. Or he would, these are, these are things he would say to his father. We could have evidence of that. The same scenario is that we have evidence that he's telling his father, I'm I'm walking along this fence line. I hear water. Oh, shit. And maybe that old shit is I fell into water. I get out of the water. I keep going down the path. I'm not on the phone with my father. That's where I get hit by a car. That's that's very likely, too. The reason why I don't like this theory is we have no evidence of of tire treads, Mm -hmm. no, like, uh, sign of a vehicle trying to stop. Uh, no sign of a vehicle trying to speed up, um, no blood evidence, and this would be dark. So yeah, to to be able to clean up that blood evidence uh, would be nearly impossible. The other thing I don't like is we know that he had a cell phone on him. We don't have you know a broken cell phone somewhere. Well, and some people regarding this theory even point out what would be the probability that if you hit a total stranger in the middle of the night of a, on an accident that, that you even decide to take the body with you and clean up the, the scene, right. you would just drive away. Right. A lot of people point out that, that there is a certain percentage that would just continue along their way. So I, it's an interesting theory to ponder, but I, I put the probability level, not very high because of, yeah, like think, you said, right, right. I no think evidence as an armchair detective or even just a law enforcement has to put this on the list of things that we have to dive into and, and rabbit holes we need to go down. It's just, with any missing person case, when we have nothing at the end of the day, you have to go, did this person run away? Did this, uh, did this, you know, did this person want to start a new life? We, these are questions that we have to keep asking ourselves over and over. And, mm-hmm. and, and I think this is an important question to ask. I think that there's just zero evidence of this. The other, another theory is that Brandon met with foul play. Now this theory encompasses several possibilities, but, but most likely two possibilities. Mm -hmm. One, Brandon fell victim to a random killer or that someone who knew him followed him. And there was some type of confrontation or ambush and Brandon was killed. Let's address these in turn. Okay. First, the random killer. This theory is that Brandon was unlucky enough to stumble upon a opportunistic killer who murdered him and disposed of his body. We have to consider what are the chances that Brandon would encounter some random psycho killer in rural Minnesota on farmland and unused roads in the middle of the night, right? This is remote, desolate area with rugged terrain at three in the morning. Now, an offshoot of this theory, of the random killer theory, is that, and this is probably, well, definitely more plausible in my opinion, is that Brandon was on private land and maybe stumbled upon a pissed off farmer. Yeah, or or someone shot and killed him and hid his body. Right. Or this is an area that you shouldn't be out in. It's like like my neighborhood, right? At three o'clock in the morning, 
I know all my neighbors. You shouldn't be driving down my road. Right? Yeah. It's it's not good. So in this case, you got a kid that's lost. Maybe the farmer doesn't know he's lost, mm -hmm. but you're on my property. If you're on my property at this time uh, of the day. I think you're a bad person. It's nothing but yeah. bad. Right. right. So therefore, uh, you know, you're going to be met with my shotgun. Right. The farmer doesn't have to be a psycho. The The farmer might be scared and assume that you are, are a psycho. psycho. Yeah. You're, you're, you're outside of my house creeping around in the middle of the night. Now, the, the so thing here is this, this is a, a, this a, another offshoot of this theory that I have seen, um, very rarely discussed. So I do want to point this out as well. This is an interesting one that possibly Brandon fell into an illegal booby trap intended for poachers or for thieves or for, you know, any number of reasons. Right. And then eventually was, was killed trapped there or was killed by the person that set the trap. Yeah. Again, you'd think a illegal booby trap. I don't know how that works. Well, the booty track. Yeah. <laughs> what? The, what they're set, what this is suggesting is that somebody has set some type of traps on their property. These could be for animals. They could be for against people, anything. Um, it's, I wouldn't throw it out of the realm of possibility. It, it does lead to the idea of why they've not found any evidence because this theory would suggest that somebody then later covered up whatever took place. Yeah, but again, it doesn't have to be illegal. It could be, you know, if somebody's coming through this field, it's nothing but bad, mm -hmm. right? Um, so he gets hurt by one of these things. They go out there. They go, again, the only reason why you'd be out here is bad. They take care of uh, Brandon. They kill Brandon and then find out later it was just a lost kid. Mm hmm and then, right. And but another, you have to be kind of psycho to, to come up with those, uh, <laughs> to want to do that. Mm -hmm. The, the other thought here, captain is hunters. Maybe somebody's out there hunting out of season. Yeah. yeah. We talked about on boys of boys on the tracks. They're out spotting for animals. So, yeah, but you should know that this, I mean, if it's accidental shoot, shooting, you should know it's not an animal because this person was talking to somebody on the phone. See, that's where I, I think an intruder thought, uh, you know, like protecting your land makes a little more sense because you, you would hear this kid talking. Mm -hmm. And so maybe you would start assuming that he's talking to somebody else that's with him, mm -hmm. uh, which would get you, you know, you'd raise, um, your suspicions a lot higher. You know. I do want to go back to the idea that maybe this wasn't a stranger that it wasn't, that there was foul play, but the offender is not a stranger because we really should address that. There are several message boards online containing posts where they're talking about local rumors regarding what took place in this case and people suggesting that Brandon either owed some people money for vehicles or drugs. It varies depending on the posts that you see and that he was actually targeted and killed as a result of these debts. Yeah. It's an interesting theory and an interesting rumor, but do we have evidence that he owed anybody money? Other than those rumors? No, right. there doesn't seem to be anything that's backing that up. And again, what's confusing about those rumors and why I think they may just be rumors is they're citing two different things that he has a debt for, right? Right. It's not like, you know, in some of the posts they're stating that he had a debt because of drugs. Other posts they're stating he had a debt because of vehicles. I think the vehicle thing would be, if there was any truth to that, it seems like mom and dad would be like, yeah, he always had all these different vehicles it. and yeah, all these yeah. strange trucks and cars and whatnot. So, and the other problem with that too, is if you in fact believe that he's, he's going, Oh shit, because he sees somebody that he's afraid of, then you have to believe why wouldn't he say anything to his father about seeing headlights, right. seeing a vehicle coming toward him that did not take place. So again, that doesn't, 
it, it makes it not ring true. I don't think either of those rumors are true. I think it's just people trying to come up with some rationale of what happened. And and even if you could prove that he owed somebody, you know, bought a little weed from somebody and owed him 20 bucks or something right. like that. I don't think there's any evidence of Brandon, you know, being a hardcore drug user. Uh, but again, or, you, you know, usually you, you have to rack up quite a bit of debt before somebody wants to kill you. Yeah, not, not so. Not if you're buying from the captain. You owe me ten bucks. It's ten bucks. I'm coming after you. Um, no, I just don't think there's a lot of evidence of that. And again, like how how much money would you have to owe somebody on a car? It seems like. It's almost like somebody came up with this idea, and yes, it's possible. But it's also possible that you owe somebody money. You you owe your buddy a thousand bucks, and he didn't come after you, and and you just happened to go missing. Mm -hmm. Well, there are two things that I believe do tend to point to Brandon being the victim of foul play. One, Brandon is listed in VICAP as a missing person. As we brought up in episode one, VICAP stands for the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program. There is not a long list of missing persons on VICAP. Last time I checked VICAP, there were 64 missing persons listed on there. And what people will point to in this case is that they believe that there is a reason why he would be on there on this short list, right? meaning that someone, whoever put him on there, believes that violence was involved in his disappearance. People point to this because they wonder if the FBI, in fact, has reason to believe that Brandon was the victim of a violent crime. The other thing regarding this, too, is that the VICAP entry for Brandon contains one interesting tidbit of information that we did mention earlier. His vehicle, the Chevy Lumina, was found with the doors open and the keys missing. We can presume that Brandon took his keys, but then why would he leave the doors open? That seems very strange to me. Was somebody else actually in the vehicle? Or did someone come along later, perhaps the following day, and open up the car, you know, looking for things to steal or, or for whatever reason? We also have Sheriff Vasecki who definitely considered and left open the possibility of foul play, saying, quote, the only thing would have been if someone was in the shadows and they got him that way, he said. He said he can't say that there wasn't someone else out there, but adding that he can't find any evidence of it, stating that cadaver dogs and searchers, he explained, should have found a body or some evidence if Swanson had succumbed to the elements adding, I can't explain why clothing belongings wouldn't surface after all these searches and after all this time. Now, in episode three, Captain, we will tear through some of these theories, get into some more. But before we go, I want to leave you with Brandon's mother, Annette Swanson, what she told the St. Cloud Times. She said her greatest fear is that people will forget Brandon. She says, talk about Brandon. Brandon is a real person. He touched a lot of lives, and don't forget him. He has a smile that lights up his whole face. He is big-hearted and kind, and he really believed in doing the right thing. So much more to get to. Stick around for part three tomorrow in the garage. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling your mother. Thanks for telling your brother. Thanks for telling your sister. Thanks for sharing on social media. All right. And everybody, make sure you be good, be kind, and don't let it.